You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast. I have Natalie Gontier. Uh, she's the author of Reticulate Evolution. Uh, she's the director of Applied Evolutionary Epistemology Lab, the Center for Philosophy of Science, it's part of a history and philosophy of science. Uh, Faculty of Science at the University of Lisbon, Portugal. So, uh, Natalie, thanks for coming. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you very much, Richard, for for inviting. I'm very happy to be here. Oh, good. Well, tell me about uh, your work. What what does your research involve? So, I am a philosopher of science. I'm a philosopher of science, and uh, I also studied comparative science of cultures, which is uh, uh, cultural anthropology. And so, my mm-hmm. main focus is uh, on uh, evolution. How uh, biologists but also people active in social cultural evolution, so anthropologists, archaeologists, and linguists, how they define evolution. And so evolutionary epistemology, the lab that I run, and also uh, the name that, that it has, evolutionary epistemology is a discipline within philosophy of, uh, of science and also uh, within theoretical biology that investigates the, the structure, the formal structure of evolutionary and so that is what evolutionary epistemology is, and that is what we do at our lab at this moment in time. We are looking into uh, different uh, mechanisms and processes of evolution that extend the modern synthesis and the near Darwinian mm. paradigm, and uh, we are looking into how they are defined, how they define units and levels of evolution and mechanisms, and how they can be implemented not only within uh, the biological sciences, but also to study aspects of uh, language and culture and, and um, other aspects in the humanities. So, uh, as I understand it, I may be wrong, the neo-Darwinists uh, say that evolution is caused by random mutation and natural selection acting upon it. But what is the, the extension you're talking about? What what have you found that uh, you think would extend the, the theory or change it? Yeah, so the, the cosmology, in a way, that the, the neo-Darwinian synthesis endorses is they look into how organisms evolve in the environment by means of natural selection. So they take as a given that the mechanism by which evolution occurs is natural selection, and they, they take as focal point of, of research the organism. And then in the 70s, so this is the modern synthesis. I'm talking about the, 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 the 1930s and the 1940s when it was founded. And following Darwin, people, they are still focused on, on the organism. But uh, around the 70s, with, for example, the introduction of Richard Dawkins' book on the selfish gene, he said that the true unit of natural selection is not the organism, but it are the genes that reside inside them. And so what we got here was a first shift from the organism to other entities in the world, in this case genes that uh, were considered to be uh, units of, of natural selection. And on the other hand, a couple of years later, um, uh, uh, you had, for example, in macroevolution, the work of Stephen G. Gould and uh, uh, Niles Eldridge when they introduced punctuated equilibria. Um, that demonstrates that evolution can go faster than predicted by natural uh, selection or by classical you know, theory. They said, well, perhaps there is a, a way in which we can understand that, that there is a, a, some kind of a species sorting. They didn't really use the term species selection, but they used the term of species sorting. So um, what happened was that, that new uh, units of uh, evolution were, in, were being introduced. So at this moment in time, people, for example, examine how, uh, what the role is of, of the cells or of organs um, that we use during development, how they can somehow impact evolution. Um, so in that regard, the, the, the classic Neo-Darwinian synthesis, they thought about this, this very strict hierarchy going from organisms 
in their environments and, and evolving by natural selection. While today we recognize that there are many different evolutionary mechanisms. So for example, the most important uh, um, um, group of, of uh, uh, mechanisms that are being more and more recognized for their importance is reticulate evolution. So reticulate evolution is evolution as it occurs by means of uh, symbiosis, symbiogenesis, lateral gene transfer, uh, hybridization. And what that demonstrates is that uh, instead of uh, the pattern, natural selection gives a pattern of descent with modification. So you have to go from one generation to the other generation. In the case of reticulate evolution, what we see is that information is being exchanged very freely uh, without sexual reproduction between organisms, between organisms of different species, between organisms that even belong to different kingdoms. Um, uh, and this is, these when are. You, when, our, you say, uh, when you say information is being exchanged, what, what do you mean? What kind of information? Are you saying genes are being exchanged or just information like, oh, I, I see a. You know, a, a butterfly flying around, so uh, you know, and that tells me something. Well, a horizontal uh, gene transfer or, or or infectious heredity, for example, is is a good example of, of how information can be exchanged. Basically, in winter, we catch the flu from the people around us that have the flu, and so what happens is that they just pass on the virus. So in this regard, the information that is being exchanged is a complete virus, and then that virus will copy. Uh, its DNA, uh, its genes into our DNA, and so that uh, uh, virus is able to, to um, uh, reproduce inside of us by making use of our uh, cellular equipment. Mm. Uh, so this is a form of horizontal uh, transfer of information exchange uh, when, when there is the passing on from a virus from one organism to the other. But information can also be passed on, like, you know, horizontally when we think about learning, uh, when when um, you think about a high school situation where a teacher provides information to the students, that's a form of horizontal transfer of information as well. So in that regard, um, one of the things that associates with the extension of the, the modern synthesis is that we are starting to rethink information. We are starting to rethink uh, patterns of evolution. We are starting to rethink mechanisms of, uh, of evolution. Well, so when someone shares information with me, like a teacher, uh, okay, it gives me, you know, mental information. It may change the way I live. Maybe it'll change my epigenetics. Maybe it'll cause me to, you know, I don't know, to take up smoking or to do some other activity, exercise more, and that epigenetically changes me. But what about my underlying DNA? You know, besides infecting me with, like, an endogenous retrovirus that integrates itself into my DNA, you know, how could I be changed maybe at the, uh, at the DNA level by the exchange of information? Well, that is that is uh, one of the things that is being studied these days within epigenetics and within Evodevo. So again, the Neo-Darwinian synthesis thought that, that uh, information flow went from genes to, to organisms uh, to species. And uh, uh, the organism, in a way, was passively selected. Uh, the, the, the organism had a passive. Uh, um, um, the, or, the organism was passive inside the environment, and the environment was the one that did the, the selecting uh, of the organism based upon whether or not it was adaptive to that environment. So, in that regard, an organism was was, was passive in so far as genes, for example, genetic mutations were understood to be the result of of, of uh, uh, random mutations. Um, uh, an organism cannot influence what kind of genes it has, and so once it is there, uh, it will be the organ. The, the, the organism in the environment is will be the environment that the, that 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 selects naturally selects that organism or not. So in that regard, it was very passive. But today we are looking into information flowing in the opposite direction. And direction. So we are looking into how an organism can change its uh, genes and how the environment can can. Uh, uh, influence how um, uh, organisms uh, uh, evolve. And so in that regard, there, there uh, is a lot of research being done uh, within epigenetics and within Evodevo on how um, um, the activation that exists of our genome, but so, so not all our genes are active all the time. So genes uh, are switched on and off all the time. And depending upon mm. the environment, some genes are, are becoming more active, other genes are being switched off and so this is something that can sometimes be passed on to the next generation. 
so this is a form of, of uh, uh, epigenetics there, there. Uh, we know, for example, that um, uh, there has been research done on that, that um, uh, people that have uh, that are descendants of the Holocaust have uh, a different, uh, you, you see it in the genome, and it is, it is uh, the consequence of what happened in the lifetime of these uh, uh, individuals and their parents that made uh, them have these changes in their genome. Yes, just to give you yeah, one you know, example. it's interesting. Yeah, you know, it's interesting is like, uh, for the most part, I guess we're looking for heritable adaptation. The epigenetics kind of, you know, it seems like it, that's it. That's what it is in part. You know, supposedly most of epigenetic changes are wiped out, you know, uh, during zygote formation or during the, you know, the sperm and the egg meeting and, you know, turning into a zygote. But some are preserved. They must be because of things like, like you mentioned, the Dutch starvation or that kind of stuff. Um I don't know. I guess my question is, when does speciation occur and why? Is it just a preponderance of changes to the point where, I don't know, reproductive isolation makes a new species and that's more fit for the environment? Does that have to happen? I guess it's a really tough question, I guess. But, you know, again, what, uh, what causes speciation based on what you, what, what you know? Well, speciation is, is something that can be caused uh, by many different ways. So there are also Darwin thought that, that uh, and this is something that Niles Eldridge was very able to capture the way that he said that. Um, uh, the idea with, with the neo-Darwinian synthesis and Darwin is that's, that organisms, uh, well, that species will evolve themselves out of its so that means that, you know, over time it is inevitable that mutations will occur, there will be random variations, there will be selection of uh, certain individuals over others. And so it is inevitable in a way, if you uh, look into that paradigm, that new species will evolve, that there will be a differentiation and that most species evolve them by splitting. So if you look at, uh, if you look at, uh, if you think about, for example, the tree of life, the idea is that new branches uh, emerge because they split off from existing branches. So a species evolves by splitting off from uh, another uh, species because they become, over time, they, they, they just become too different. But this is not always the case. For one, for example, there are species that appear to be living fossils, and that is a term that uh, uh, is used to refer to organisms that just do not seem species are there uh, and then they, they, they are morphologically similar to the, the species when they were first uh, uh, evolving sometimes a million years ago. Um, examples of that are, for example, Scorpios. Scorpios, uh, Scorpio is the star, <laughs> the, the scorpion, the animal, uh, is a, the scorpion is a, is a living fossil. It, it does not seem to evolve much morphologically. Um, uh, if you compare a, a present scorpion or, or when it was, when we find the first uh, uh, fossils in the fossil record, there does not seem to be much change. So that idea that, that a species will naturally evolve itself out of existence into another species is not always the case. Another thing uh, is that species do not only evolve by speciation, by splitting off uh, from the tree of life, symbiosis, symbiogenesis has demonstrated that uh, sometimes um, um, uh, evolution and the evolution of a new species occurs because there is a merger of lineages or because there is horizontal transfer between lineages. Um, sometimes hybridization leads to speciation. It leads to the introduction of a new species. So in that regard, why do species evolve and, and, and how? That is a, a question that, that requires more than one answer. Okay. So what's the... Uh... Since you're looking at the, I guess, the cultural side a little bit and the anthropological side, what does that tell you that it may not tell other scientists? Like, What unique things are you discovering, you believe? Well, one of the things that I think that especially the social, cultural, and the linguistic sciences are demonstrating is that you can show that everything evolves. Um, for many years in the biological sciences, people have thought very strongly about what the true unit of natural selection is, not even of evolution, but of natural selection. And so some people thought it was the genes, uh, other people thought it was the organism, and this has, has divided for many years, uh, many different disciplines. While if you look into the sociocultural science and the linguistic sciences, there uh, people are, are, are making phylogenies, so tree models and network models, on, on how uh, 
different elements of culture evolve. So they look into variation and evolution of tools. Uh, they look into changes in text, textual analysis, how, 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 how uh, writing changes over time, how cultural artifacts change over time, how ideas change over time. And you can basically demonstrate that, that uh, most uh, ideas that we have on evolution about descent with modification or reticulation, these patterns, they are there. And we can talk about these in, in terms of, an, of evolution. We can use the uh, evolutionary yard when to talk about language, how they change over time. That is a form of evolution. How cultures change over time is a form of evolution. And there we see that there are many, many different uh, units of, of, uh, of cultural and social evolution. Skateboard decks, the television, the automobile. Uh, so examples of material culture, we can we can demonstrate that they that they evolve over time. So yeah, what any interesting phenomena that you're focusing on? Any particular evolutions of phenomena that uh, you know really captivate your attention? So at the moment, I'm very interested in language evolution, and we just uh, recently last week had uh, here the 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 reiteration, the sixth reiteration of uh, proto language. So um, I'm I'm in the permanent board of a group of people investigating proto language, and proto language is a language that we define as a, an intermediate communication system between, on the one hand, a communication systems, and on the other hand, modern human language. So the idea is that language evolved from a communication systems, but that there must be intermediate steps. And so we try to, to, to define those uh, and also ask the question, who had language? Did the Neanderthal, for example? And so we had here in, uh, in Lisbon, in Portugal, in, at the Calusi Gulbenka Foundation a conference where we had around 180 people in passing discussing uh, archaeology, anthropology, primatology to, to, to investigate, you know, how do you define communication, how do you model communication, also a lot of people working in artificial intelligence. And so uh, my interest at this moment is very much uh, caught up in, uh, in language in that regard. Hmm. Okay. So what uh, what do you believe? I, mean, I don't know. Are there any imminent breakthroughs you believe or big changes coming to how people think about evolution? Yes. So I think in, in general, we are moving towards a, a form of plur pluralism, a form of what they, they call in philosophical jargon, a form of epistemic or epistemological pluralism, which means that we recognize that there are different mechanisms out there, that there are different mechanisms and different processes. And so the big question today is not um, uh, the fights that there were, for example, with people adhering to microevolution or microevolution or mesoevolution. The question is, how do we conceptualize this plurality of mechanisms? How do we conceptualize that evolution can at one point go slow and at another point go fast? At one point goes randomly, at one point it is directed, and at one point uh, evolution is vertical, and at another point it is horizontal. And so this requires us to come to terms with an enormous amount of, of complexity, uh, and we need to think about how can we model this complexity. And one way, for example, that is uh, one, one thing that is interesting in that regard is that in general, in all these different sciences, biological, social, cultural, linguistic, uh, people are moving away from tree of life typology and they are introducing network networks to 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 demonstrate the the, the multiple ways in the, in which different entities often interact um and so this is something that that in that regard i'm i'm studying so my idea there would be we are moving towards pluralism and we are also moving towards uh, a different way of modeling complexity and that happens through networks what do you mean that that happens through networks what would be an example of how this would work? Well, so if you look at uh, classical uh, uh, Darwinian thinking again, so the idea that speciation occurred by splitting off uh, by a branch that splits into two branches, right? So you have a ramification in the tree of life. Today, you know, when, when, when we look into how a virus uh, uh, penetrates one organism, so how, how a virus produced by, uh, how a virus, for example, so the flu, you get the flu. Viral particles within you are multiplying. When you cough, these viral particles are 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 uh, uh, going. Uh, they are uh, coming into the air in the airstream, and so a person next to you breathes in uh, uh, parts of these viruses that come from your breath. 
and they become infected uh, by um, the flu because of it. This is a form of horizontal uh, um, transfer, and this is something that we know that, that uh, uh, well, we used to think that this was only something that influences on touch and development, because most viruses, they do not infect the, the sex cells. And so the idea was that this cannot be transferred uh, from one generation to the next. Uh, so what happened during your lifetime had a, was of no influence. But today we know that that is not always the case, that some viruses somehow make their way into the germline, and so they can be transmitted uh, uh, not only uh, horizontally, but also vertically. Now, if you want to model something like that, you cannot do that within the tree of life. You have to start drawing connections uh, in different ways. Also, if you uh, investigate not only how genes bring forth organisms and how they bring forth species, but how a gene of one organism uh, induces a change in, the, in, in uh, a, a, an organism belonging to another species, you have to start drawing networks. It's very natural, you know. As soon as you start thinking about it, you start to draw a network. And so that uh, annihilates the... The, the, the possibility of, of, of in those connections to look at, at that from the tree of life. So, okay, so networks uh, are what cause all these various transfers of information and, you know, genes and other types of materials. So it's the network itself that, that's really behind evolution. Is that the, the premise? And that is something else. So on the one hand, we, we see that scientists are understanding evolution better by drawing networks instead of of life. Now, of course, uh, does that imply that evolution is itself a network? Well, I don't know if that is, uh, if there is a one-one uh, isomorphy or a one-one correspondence there, I do not know, but it is a very intriguing thing to think about. Perhaps, yes, evolution by itself is a, is a network-like process. It is possible, yes. That is a very interesting question that, uh, um, one does not follow from the other, but it's something that might be worthwhile to, to uh, look into, yes. Okay. So the question so, uh, of right. if we not, yes. Well, in, in, okay, so what about backtracking now? Do you ha do you feel like you have any different insight on how life might have began? Well, um... I know it's an easy question. I'm just teasing yeah. you, but, you know, why not ask it? Yeah, there, there are very, uh, there are multiple theories also about how life evolved, and there are also... Uh, again, it becomes obvious uh, more and more the role that has been played by symbiogenesis. So we know that if we look into uh, uh, the origin of uh, the eukaryotic cell, which is the cell with the nucleus and often also with organelles, with tiny bodies within that cell, we know that those um, uh, are the result of symbiotic merger. So at one point we had a cell. Uh, with genes inside and uh, the development of the nucleus. Some people already say that that was a symbiogenetic event, other people deny that. But regardless, eukaryotic cells often have organelles, and these organelles are uh, tiny bodies within uh, these cells, and we know these uh, organelles descend from bacteria. So at one point, uh, bacteria must have invaded these uh, uh, primary cells, and they have evolved into uh, cell bodies, and that is the, the process of symbiogenesis. We know, for example, that mitochondria uh, evolved from, from uh, uh, purple bacteria, and we also know that cyanobacteria uh, evolved into uh, the chloroplast that we find in plant cells, and uh, which enables a plant to have its color, most of the time green. Um, and so we know that... that, that uh, those those uh, organelles used to be free living bacteria. Hmm. Um, do you think that all the organelles were a result of symbiogenesis? You know, I know the mitochondria is reputed to be, but again, do you think that other organelles, uh, you know, like the ribosome, the Golgi apparatus, etc., do you think they're all instances of symbiogenesis? No, it is not something that can be, uh, per definition, said that all organelles have evolved by symbiogenesis. Most certainly not. But uh, it is uh, demonstrated beyond reasonable doubt through genetic uh, comparisons that uh, the mitochondria uh, and the chloroplasts are, are the result of, of uh, bacterial emerging. Oh, okay. I just didn't know there's any evidence at all or thought that uh, 
you know, other organelles so came, the evidence, came from the evidence, cytogenesis. The evidence is, is, is there. So at this moment in time, uh, well, a couple of years ago, people um, compared the genes present in mitochondria and in free living bacteria, bacteria that are alive today that are the descendants of these uh, purple bacteria. And up until this day, the genes are very, uh, they, they resemble each other a lot. So it is beyond reasonable doubt because they resemble each other that much that it is unlikely, impossible, statistically speaking, that they come from anywhere else. Okay, yeah, I just wondered, I thought maybe because uh, the mitochondria has genes in it that they thought, oh, well, that must have come from a bacteria, but since maybe the ribosome doesn't appear to have any genes in it, then no. You know, it seems like that was the, the reasoning behind why people are convinced that, you know, the, the mitochondria, again, it's a, it was some biogenic events, but other organelles, no. Well, the, the chloroplast is certain. Um, at one point, people looked into uh, lysosomes, perhaps being uh, of uh, bacterial descent. These, these are questions, uh, but there, there, it was not um, at all obvious. Uh, whether that was the case or not, uh, but it is something that is not really uh, investigated further these days. So, but um, yeah. Okay. Well, I, you know, again, I just wondered. So uh, interesting. Yeah. So, uh, but any insights that do you feel like you have any unique insights on to how life might have began based on your work and your research, or is it just like no one knows? Well, I'm. I'm I, I I wrote a book on theories on the the origin of life. But uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that I, I developed my own theory on that. What I uh, have done more in my career is I have looked into this, this, this formal structure of evolution. And so um, for a long time, evolution has been defined based upon natural selection. So it was uh, evolution is that what evolves by means of natural selection. And one of the things that I have been uh, thinking about is a new way of defining evolution that is neutral enough to include these different kinds of evolutionary mechanisms that are out there. And in that regard, I define evolution as uh, the, 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 the phenomenon whereby units evolve at levels of an ontological hierarchy by mechanisms and processes. And that is a, 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 a lot to say that beyond genes, beyond uh, um, organisms, there can be different units of evolution. So a unit of evolution can be a gene, it can be an organism, it can also be uh, an organelle, it can be a bacterium, if we look into these uh, events of symbiosis. So there can be many units. This is a way of, of accepting that pluralism of units. Another, uh, so units evolve at levels, and there also the level you see the environment. But uh, the environment has also been redefined in many ways. So uh, when Darwin was talking about selection for him, that occurred in the external environment. So, so uh, nature, in a way, as we would have called it. But today we know that selection uh, often also occurs inside the organism. And Lewontin, for example, he called that the internalization of selection. So we know that genes are uh, uh, switched on and off. So that in itself is a selection process that happens within the genome um, uh, during, for example, uh, the transcription and translation. Uh, there is a selection of certain genes. Um, we also know that when organi or organs are formed, that that is a form of a selection process. Also, if you look at immunology, that is a form of a selection process. So in that regard, people have introduced the concept of multi-level selection. And so people have also been looking into um, how uh, uh, one gene, for example, can evolve at the level of the organism, at the level of the brain, of, at the level of an organ, at the level of the genome itself. And in that regard, there also I have uh, even uh, brought in that idea further by recognizing that a level, um, uh, well, there are multiple levels, but it is not only multi-level selection theory that we have to apply there. We also need to look to how uh, um, levels associate with, with symbiosis theory. In that regard, for example, um, people look into how um, um, uh, an organism plus its microbiome and plus its virion becomes a new biological and, and that entity, for example, is a holobiont and the holobiont mm. um, is, is not only a new biological individual, it is also a new 
um, uh, habitable zone of life. It forms a new environment. It forms a new ecology. So in that regard, we also need to come to terms with the pluralism that there is of level. So uh, evolution is when units evolve at certain levels. And then within an ontological hierarchy, and this is the question, we need to, when we accept pluralism of units and levels, we need to think about the structure in which these uh, uh, bring forth the, the, the reality that is out there. And in that regard, uh, I think in that regard that we are moving towards a form of network typology to understand evolution and, and that this hierarchy uh, is, is uh, network-like. So in that regard, evolution is units that evolve at levels of an ontological hierarchy and then by mechanisms and processes. And these mechanisms and processes are beyond natural selection, also symbiosis, symbiogenesis, also genetic drift, mechanisms of epigenetics, of evodevo. And so um, my contribution in, in that field is looking for the formal structure, which is this new definition of it. Mm, okay. So for listeners, what's a, a way for them to, I don't know, start understanding the complexity? Because it just seems, uh, you know, insanely complex, everything that's going on and how to grasp it. So, you know, what are some suggestions for people that, again, they're somewhat new to evolution, evolutionary biology, and, you know, how do they start? Well, I think people people need to, to um, read, read, you know, read a lot of books and, and, and um, in that regard, like, make the selection to not only look for books that explain life by means of natural selection, but to look for books on symbiosis and symbiogenesis on uh, on uh, on virology there are a lot of popular books being written on that on the tree of life on the network of life and so that is i think a way to to, to um, get more knowledge about that um in this regard also i am part of of a, of a community which is called the third way of evolution and the third way of evolution is uh, a group of, of uh, biologists, but also people from outside of biology, philosophy of science, philosophy of biology, virology, botany, uh, that uh, are, are uh, unset. We are not satisfied with how um, neo Darwinian theory continues to dominate the scientific paradigm and the, the, the ideas of evolution, how they portray these ideas with the media how they publish books that are in many ways outdated because they, or, 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 or they just do not take certain parts of, of, of evolutionary research into account. They dominate funding, and, and we don't like that. And in that regard, we uh, uh, I'm part of this group of, of the Third Day of Evolution, which is an initiative by um, uh, Dennis Noble and James Shapiro and uh, uh, Raju, uh, and, and uh, they have made this website that is a collective of books and articles uh, where people can start looking at uh, this new biology that is evolving. Okay, very good. And where can people find uh, you know, your specific papers and research and your thoughts? What's so a good I, way for I them have, to get in contact? Uh, I have my own lab that has a website with you, so the Applied Evolutionary Epistemology Lab, which is at the Center for Philosophy of Science. And then all my papers are on Academia Edu, so if people just... Google my name, then they find my, my web page, and then my papers are there. Okay. And also, well, very proto -language, good. if people are interested in proto-language, we have a, a website uh, on proto-language. And also, I, I am the, the series editor of the, uh, the Springer Nature book series, Interdisciplinary Evolution Research. And we have, the, mm -hmm. we have made some, some very interesting books on uh, macroevolution. We had a, a thematic volume on macroevolution. We had a thematic volume on reticulate evolution. We had one on primate cognition, and we had one on um, uh, language and communication. So, if people are interested, I, I would suggest to have a look there. Well, very good. Well, Natalie, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Richard. It was a pleasure talking with you. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. 
you may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you.